Hello everyone, welcome to The Dev Method. My name is Ricky. Today we're gonna to be talking about sets versus arrays in Swift. So if you don't know what a set is, that's understandable. It's not the very first thing you might gravitate to when learning programming or when learning a new language. Um, it is probably in iOS uh, one of the uh, most underused data structures uh, that you could use or a collection, it's a collection type. So um, what do we mean by a collection? Because sets and arrays are collections, so a set is a unique set of elements, so a unique collection of elements, and an array is an array of many elements, and there could be duplicates, uh, and that's the whole idea between sets and arrays is that you want to eliminate duplicates. It doesn't mean that that's the only reason why you use it. There's other performance characteristics out of uh, finding something that's in the array, for example. It's going to be different um, time complexity, and it's going to be a different performance you get out of it rather than sets. So let's talk about that right now. So currently I have um, just a regular import of foundation, and this is where we get the set in the array. So let me at least just declare one real quick. I'll declare an array. It's going to be of integer. So we put that there in the square brackets, right? And we're just declaring our type. And currently I'm just going to make it empty. So now I option click on array and I get a little summary, declaration, discussion, um, all sorts of things, code examples of how to use this. You're going to want to know the difference between this then and then the array, or I'm sorry, this and the set. So let's do a set of integers equals like this. Now option click on the set. Now you have a whole discussion of the set. So one thing I want to point out is that um, there's a difference in the elements or the, the parts, the, uh, I, I guess you'd say like, if you think of it as like a bag of something, so you have a, a backpack and you're gonna put stuff in it, so it's like you're gonna put pens in it. So that would be one type of collection, a bag of pens. Um, or you're gonna put notebooks in it, so a bag of notebooks. Or you're gonna put, um, I don't know, marbles in it, so it'd be a bag of marbles. So replace bag now with array. So you have an array of elements, so it's like your bag, a bag of elements, so a bag of marbles, a bag of pens, a bag of notebooks, something like that. So here we're taking um, a bag of integers. So with the integer here, um, the difference is in the declaration of that array. So notice array here just says it's an array of element. It actually doesn't know what the element is, and that's okay. Now, there is a type constraint over the set. So the set also doesn't know what the element is, but there's at least one characteristic about it that it does need. And that is that the element has to be hashable. So that's what this thing says here. So we have to talk about hashable then too. So let's just say we have another variable and it's gonna be an integer. Well, it's gonna be an integer. We're gonna say it's a hashable. So here we go, 34, the integer 34. So what then is hashable? Um, notice it's saying hashable, can't necessarily do something like this, but I'm doing this so I can do the option click. But this is kind of the idea. So it might not work out with the compiler, but um, it shows here that hashable actually inherits its same capabilities from another protocol called equatable. That's the first thing, um, but each Thing that is hashable, so an integer, for example, is hashable, um, and some other concrete types that Swift already comes with, like strings, they are hashable. And what it means is that there is a unique value, and that value is expressed as a hash value, or like a hash code, it might be called. And 34 is going to have a different hash code than, say, 35, or 237 or 299, or 99, they're all gonna be different because we know that they're actually unique. So the thing that produces the hash code is like your hash algorithm. That is something we don't have to worry about with Swift. Um, we have one built in. You could write your own. I don't encourage it to do that as a beginner, but if you wanna take a look at that, go ahead, search out online hash algorithms, find one that suits this type of um, use case. But the whole point being here, what I just wanna show you, is that integer is hashable. 
Um, so is double. Some of the built-in types inside of Foundation and Swift are hashable, but you can also make your own types hashable. So now that we have that idea of what's hashable, let's just say we now have an array of integers. And I'll say one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? So what would be the difference between these two if I made them exactly the same? So it doesn't seem like much up front, um, but there are different capabilities of each. So like array.append, um, let's see, we have capacity, we have count, um, custom mirror, some of these things, distance to and from, another thing. Um, so yeah, there's quite a few things that we have here. Oh yeah, look at this, hash into, I don't even think, yeah, we don't necessarily want to do that. But the whole point being, we scroll down, yeah, here it is, index after, index before. So like we have like a guaranteed order, at least with this type of array. Um, inside of Swift. So we know that this is the first thing. So like if we were to print out first, okay, now we run it to this point, um, we should get one as the first thing in the array. So that's the idea. Um, so here it is, here's one. Notice even in the preview on the right hand side, if you take a look at this, the preview for one, two, three, four, five, six, but like we don't actually see that same order, especially like what is put in here. So the set is actually not a guaranteed order. So let's just try and see, could we do first in a set? Let's just try that to see what, what happens. So just get four, just what it randomly chose as being the first thing in the, uh, in the set. So the whole point of what I'm trying to show you here is that there's already a difference in not what you could necessarily put in it, like it has to be hashable or has to be, or it can't be hashable, but also the ordering of what you put in it. Um, so this first is never guaranteed to always be the first thing. So gotta look out for that. Now here's, here's another thing that you might wanna do. So besides first, let's say, um, let's see, insert. So if we wanna insert something into the array, uh, we can insert a new element, so let's say 99, but what do we want to insert it at? Well, arrays are indexed by zero, so this would be zero, one, two, three, right? So just to give you an idea, this is more or less what the indexes would be. So if I wanted to insert something at uh, index here, so that would be index one, I put that in here like so. Now I actually uh, can't do this because it's not a var. More about mutating functions in a separate video, if you want to see that, it's a just click a link here if I figure out how to do the link thing in the videos. But the whole point being, now I can insert it. And I want to insert 99. And now if I was to print out x here, you'll actually see that we've inserted it like so. But let's say we want to insert that same value inside the set. Let's change this to var so we could have the var um, of y be mutable as well. So you say insert. Now notice here, insert, you actually don't have an index. So you don't have like an order. You're not saying insert it in the fifth place or the second place or the last or the first. Um, you're just saying insert this new element. So if I insert 99 now, and uh, let's go ahead and print out Y so you can see what that looks like. So here it is. So 99 did get inserted. So like the capacity or like, the, I'm sorry, the count or the size of each one of these is the same. They now both have the same amount of elements in them, but there's those differences between them. So that's at least some of the idea of how to use some of these sets or some of these arrays um, in Swift. And I just wanted to give you a little taste of the differences between those. But now here's the big thing. Um, let's just say we have our own types. So in Swift, we do a lot of abstraction, or in object-oriented programming, you do a lot of abstraction. So uh, let's just do a type here of Ricky, and they have a name. Well, you know what? Let's make it a little bit more abstract. Let's say a human has a name, a uh, human has an age, and that, that'll be an integer as well. Um, so let's just make an array of humans. 
So I'll call this x again, and this will be our array of human. Okay. And what's a human we could put in here? Well, we have to construct one. Got to give it a name and an age. So I'll do Ricky, 99. Let's do another human. Uh, we got Andrew, let's say 22. And then a human, let's say Arik, and uh, 44. There we go. So these are humans. Let me separate them out on multiple lines so we could see this a little bit cleaner, a little bit easier. Um, there we go. All right, so th three humans in that array. Um, if we were to build and run this, that's totally fine. That works with Swift. Uh, these elements here are of human, and it's guaranteed that each one of those humans has these properties, and these properties cannot be changed because they have a let property, so constant. Okay, let's try the same thing now, but with a set of human. And the shorthand here, very similar to what we just saw with integers, um, but let's take all these guys, these humans, and put them in here. Okay, and let's run this and see what happens. Already, just out of the, out of the gates, can't even compile. We got an issue, what does it say? It says type human does not conform to protocol hashable. So you cannot have this type human in a set. It's just not gonna work. Now here's the thing. Sometimes you're gonna get something from a database, like if you're doing any kind of like APIs, HTTP APIs, WebSockets and whatnot, um, you could have something that's like an ID, could be an integer, could be a string, and it is your backend developer's job uh, to maybe guarantee that an ID is a unique ID for any human that you get into your application. So you have some sort of assumption there that it'll never be different. So you could do that as an ID. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna make an ID here of one, and then an ID of two. And I'm showing you this as being guaranteed is all different, but you know, sometimes they could be not as different. So what, what could you do to make human then hashable if you're gonna add these IDs in here? Give me a second while I add in some of these down below. Okay, there we go. All right, so same thing on both. So you could say, all right, well, this is going to be hashable. Okay. Now, um, how do you then implement hashable? Well, there's a couple different ways. Um, oops, let me add this here. Hash. Can you get this in auto completion or no? And, nope, I guess they're not. Okay, here, I found it. Um, hash, and then into, and it's an in-out parameter. I know we haven't talked about that on this channel, but maybe in the future we can do that. Um, but let's just say there's hasher like so. And then what do you do with this hasher? You say, okay, you take the, uh, the into dot combine, and then you combine all these values together. So you'd say like self.id. You could do that, and then you could stop. However, I wouldn't recommend that. That's not what I would consider to be um, unique. You know, it's very possible that you have an ID that's unique and is supposed to be guaranteed unique, but you gotta trust your backend developers to um, uphold that standard. But if you really wanna make sure that they're not unique, or that they are unique, um, you're gonna add in all the properties. So every single property then has to be unique. So that's that's the rule that you wanna live by. So we'll do the name in here and combine also the age. So those three properties. So now we've actually made that hashable and we can add this into a set. So this is actually now going to compile. Um, this will work. So now what if we have something like human and we add in a duplicate. Well, this is what we'd get. Let me see if I could show you. Yeah, here we go. So I'm gonna show you on the left-hand side here. Um, even though I've added in, even on the constructor of, of this set, I've added in four humans, um, I actually added a duplicate one on purpose just to show you that it still has three. So it's still gonna have each element be unique. So. I can never add in accidentally the same human again. 
There's advantages and disadvantages to that. I'd say there's definitely a lot of advantages when it comes to aggregating data from multiple data sources, putting in one, and you want to guarantee that each one is unique. This is your definite way to do that. So that's your set on human. Um, I'm going to take out that one here. Let me, let's see, can I remove this? Let's remove this. Nope, okay. I don't, there we go. So that's the human. It's hashable. Now, let's take it a step further. Let's say you don't want to do that work. Well, you don't have to. I did look up what this method definition is, but here's the thing. Um, at least with a struct in Swift, this is a special thing for a struct. If each of these properties, these are each stored properties. These are not calculated properties where it's only a getter. Um, so in this ID, the name, and the age, if each one of those properties types, so in this case, int and string and int again, if each one of those are hashable, then you can actually have this be hashable and not have to write this boilerplate code. So you just do it like so. Extremely helpful. Like if anytime you have an API response from the back end, I'd say it's best to write it as a struct and then just put hashable on there there you go, you're done. You could put this in a set, you could put it in an array. Um, these can even be keys inside your dictionaries or your maps. So this, the whole, this, this whole construct of a struct automatically filling in the implementation of your, your hash, it's great, I, I love it. It's one of the easiest things that you could do in Swift um, when you're trying to make your elements hashable. So if I make this a class, you'll see that um, human here needs some sort of implementation. Um, also, I need an initializer, so there's no initializer for this. Can't do that. Yeah, so I'll put it back to struct. Um, another great thing about just automatically having these here set to something, uh, I'm sorry, ha have automatically have each of these property types as hashable. You're not only getting hashable, but you're also getting equatable. So for example, if I had Ricky and Ricky, these two humans, does this equal this Ricky? And the answer actually would be true. Take out that comma, there we go. Yeah, see, those two, they equal true. So already getting that out of the box with a struct, I think it's a great, great tool for you to have. So that's the difference here with your array and your set. You can have the same kind of items here, but notice as soon as I made this a class, I gotta fill in the implementation myself. If I take hashable off of here and it's not hashable anymore, well, now I can't use the set. I can still use the array, so great. So thanks for watching today. If you guys have any questions about adding your elements or your objects into a set versus an array, at least you got an idea of where to get started. Uh, check out the links below if you want to learn a little bit more about some of the differences between the two. If you have questions, put them in the comments or um, you know, contact me and then I'll try and do my best to answer those questions. So thanks for watching.